Good morning, everybody. Um, kids, this is your moment. If you are 0 to 14, you're going with, I think, Carla, are you? Yeah? Perfect. Carla and Amelia. And then, as mentioned, we have the crash. Adults, you can check it out later. You're not allowed in there. I'm not going to lie, though. It's a really comfy sofa with a TV. It's almost like a better setting to listen to me preach. But it's for um, younger ones if they want to be, if they need to be in there. And for the rest of you, let's just extend a hand and just pray a blessing. Father, we thank you for our young people. We thank you because there is legacy in them. And we thank you, Father, because we know that you have anointed them, you have called them, and it is not about their age. It's about their understanding and their roots going deep in you. And we pray that this morning they would know the love of God and in, be invaded by him. Amen. Amen. Wow. It's wonderful. I'll just let those guys go to their group. How are we all doing this morning? It's good to be back. I was in Wolverhampton last week. I just feel like I haven't been around as much just because I actually remembered um, a couple weeks ago I was preaching and I was so unwell that someone came up to me afterwards and went, what you said? And they quoted what I said and they were like, it was really good. I had no recollection of saying that. So I was like, thank you, Lord, that you still are moving even when we're not well. Um, but we're back, and God has given us our, my strength back, and I am grateful to him for that, because I have a message today. Um, if we could have the graphic up, please. It's, we're finishing off our series today that we've been going over, um, Kingdom Life, and there it is. The, I want to I finish this series that we've been talking about. It's kind of gone in different directions for those who have been here regular, or if you're following online on the YouTube, um, I really want to encourage you, actually, let me just do a small plug here. Watch our stuff online. We actually put a lot of time and effort for a reason. It's not so that we look fancy, so that you can be equipped during the week. So you can go over the messages, you can go over the resources that we have here, follow the ark, listen to the teachings that are coming out from the ark church, the teachings that are coming out from Wolverhampton, and there's so many other ministries. If you want a list of being able to listen to a sermon from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed every single day, I promise you I've got enough lists. There are enough amazing men and women of God all over the world putting out content. Feed yourself. Feed yourself with the Word of God. Feed yourself with revelation that people are having. And let it be what you focus on. You know, we spend so much time... Oh, I'm going to go on it. We spend so much time feeding ourselves on the wrong stuff. We really do. And I'm not just talking physically, but that's true as well. Um, <laughs> but I'm talking spiritually and emotionally. We spend so much time on unhealthy. We spend so much time on these things. And I think I've said this before, but I want to encourage you as a church, be the, be the people who refuse to listen to the gossip, refuse to spend time or give energy to slander, and, you know, I was looking up a preacher the other day because I, I, I read one of his books and I just went, oh, I want to find on YouTube just some of his messages. Do you know, I had to scroll for three pages to find stuff that wasn't against him. And all these videos have millions of views of Christians just slandering and attacking and judging and, and millions of views. And then I went to one of his preachers, which was one of the best preachers I've ever heard on just the love of God. And it had a couple hundred views. And I was just like, ah, it, that's an indication of the church's heart sometimes. This has got nothing to do with my message, but it's just, it's in my heart. So spend time, feed yourself with the right stuff. Feed yourself with the right stuff. And yes, we are growing. I, I appreciate what you're saying about my office. I'll be honest, I'm okay. Um, but it's quite funny. My car still has four boxes full of books uh, that I haven't got home for right now because I'm trying to convince Carla to, that I can get another bookshelf in my office at home. And I can do an, And she's like, but it changes the room. I'm like, I know, books, I love them. So I've got loads of books that I need to, to put up in my shelf. But it's great because this is what God's doing. Look around. Look at what God's doing. We've been here for just over two years. I was with the youth on Thursday night, and there were 17 of us. How amazing is that? Youth started in September. That's it. Youth started in September, and we had 17 on Sunday. That's with the adults as well, but there were 17 of us together, 
and we just got to talk, and they had some real questions. I didn't realize, I thought Kate was joking when she said to the youth, hey, John's coming, so make sure you get the hard questions. She wasn't kidding. First question I get asked is, how many days was it between Adam being, bought, being created and the fall? <laughs> and I was like, this is a 12-year-old asking me this question. And I'm like, well, let's get a, um, and it was great. And they had all, all of the kind of questions, and it was a great time. And, and God's moving. God's doing stuff. Look, I want to encourage you, don't just be a Sunday attendee. Be part, be plugged in. We'll talk about this in a second. But if you really want to see the kingdom advance, you have to be part of it. You have to plug in. You have to be connected. You have to be part of the community. So I'm actually going to get on track and talk about my message. Are you ready? So I want to talk about unleashing the kingdom of God. Come on, who realizes that that's our calling? At the end of the day, above all else, we have to unleash his kingdom. God is, God is not inactive. A lot of the times we are. He's wanting to move. He's wanting to heal. He's wanting to save. He's wanting to set free. And, but he loves co-laboring with us. He can do it all on his own. He did. Jesus literally came to earth and showed us how to do it. And then he went and he said, and now I'm sending you another so that you can see even greater miracles than I have seen while I'm with you. And he's come to his people, his church, his, his body, his loved ones, and saying, come on, let's do this. And a lot of the time, our response is, I'll see you on Sunday. And that's not the calling on your life. The calling on each one of our lives is to bring and unleash his kingdom, no matter our circumstances. If you're just with family that day, if you're running your business, if you're in whatever it is, your calling is to bring the kingdom wherever you are. That is the call on each one of our lives. Not just me, because I'm standing on a pulpit. Each one of you. It's the ministry of all believers to go and advance the kingdom of God. So if you've got your Bibles, grab them, please. We're in Acts 4. I want to, I'm going to put some context on the passage, but then I want to read quite a bit of scripture this morning <clears throat> with you. So if you grab Acts 4, um, so for some context for the passage I'm about to read, um, this is after the day of Pentecost. So Jesus has already ascended into heaven. The, the disciples waited um, in the upper room. The Holy Spirit has fallen. They've already been on the street. There's always already stuff happening. This is, but this is like early days. This is probably still day one of the, of the Holy Spirit falling um, in Jerusalem. And Peter and John are on their way to the temple. And this is in, in chapter 3. And they're on their way to the temple, and they find the man at the gates. Um, he's a lame man, and he, it's the well-known passage where he asks them for, he's, he's begging for money, and he's there, and he's been there his entire life. And Peter replies to the well-known passage, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man is healed in that moment, in that very instant. He gets up and he's healed. And the people are amazed, and this is where Peter then delivers this incredible message saying, this is the kingdom. I'm summarizing it. I encourage you to read your Bibles. To Acts chapter 3, this is the kingdom. This should be the norm. This is what Jesus paid a price for, that we could walk up to those who are in need, and instead of giving them money and gold and silver, that's just going to perpetuate his problem. I actually have something greater. It's the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he gets healed. And we jump into this passage. And we're going to read from Acts 4. Uh, I'm going to read from verse 1 all the way to 24, actually. I want to really go through all this together. Are you ready? You got your Bibles? Who loves the Word of God? I'm okay to spend... I'm, if I just read for the rest of the sermon, I'm good with that as well. But here we go. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection 
of the dead. So they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in the jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. That's a good message right there. That is a good Sunday morning. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, was there. And so was Siphias, John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you build as rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven to give mankind by sorry, under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. See, they ordered them to withdraw from the Sandahiri, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. I want you to hear this part. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking of what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed for was miraculously healed, was over 40 years old. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. I want to pull you back to that verse 20. I'm going to read it from the ESV. For we, this is Peter and John's reply. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak. We have no other choice. There is no other option for Peter and John at this stage. They're under threat. They've been arrested for healing someone. Someone who's, and it's not even just a story. The man is there in front of them. 5,000 people gave their lives to Jesus that, the night before. And the church, the religious rulers, are judging this situation. And Peter and John are standing trial. This is a serious situation for them. And something happens in them, and it says, and it's an important passage there, it says that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, replied. Now, do you remember what Peter was doing shortly before? Denying Jesus three times. The same Peter who denied Jesus, denied even knowing him, lied to a little girl, who's on the third time was like, you mu- you, I've seen you with him. And he lies to a child like, no, you're wrong. You're making this up. That same Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And something happens that he was so afraid of these same rulers that now, even though he's facing these same rulers that he lied to, to protect his own skin, he's standing in front of them and saying, I have no other option. I cannot but speak of what I've seen and heard. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only way. He is the only way. There can't be another option for us. 
Something happened to the early disciples that radically changed them. They gave their lives, each one of them, for the truth of the gospel. They gave their lives preaching and praying for the sick and casting out demons and advancing his kingdom. Each one of them paid the highest price for it. But there's something that strikes me in this. Because I've heard this passage preached so many times and I've, I've heard, come on, it's all about courage and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And those are all very true things, right? But why are they actually in this situation? Because of what they were preaching or because of what they did? It's originally because of what they did. Because they actually brought the kingdom. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The kingdom of God is of power, not of word, Paul says. The kingdom of, is of, of God is of power, not of word. Now, is it important to be able to tell people about the gospel? Is it important to be able to word the kingdom? Of course it is. But ultimately, if it's just words, it doesn't change lives. But if it's with power, suddenly you've got a man who's been Ill, uh, Ill for 40 years, who's in front of the church. I know it's not the church, it's the temple, but you get my point. He's in front of the building. He's in front of where everyone goes to worship day in, day out. They went at least three times a day. Imagine that. Every single day for three, three times a day, every single day for 40 years, you've had Christians walking past you. Again, I realize they're not called Christians at the time. You get what I'm saying. I'm putting it in our context. Every single day. And it took Peter and John to stop and actually bring the kingdom. And the response of the people is to try and, well, is to put them in prison. I'm sorry. Let's be specific. The response of the leaders, because the response of the people was to believe and to the 5,000 of them were added. But the leaders were the problem. Nowadays, I wouldn't say it's just the leaders that are the problem in the church. It's those who have been in church so long that we've got stagnant. And we like our routines. And we don't like getting pushed out of our comfort zone. We did that at the beginning of my Christian walk. You know, at the beginning, it was all new, and I had to figure it out. And what does it mean to be a Christian? And, oh, I have to recognize that sin is real. And, and you go through all this, and then you kind of get to this stage where you plateau. It's very easy to plateau in your walk with God. It's very easy to be content serving in the same ministry in church, which is, again, a wonderful thing. Please don't let us understand me. What do you do for the kingdom? I welcome at the front door. Wonderful. Serve your brothers. That is wonderful. What else are you doing for him? Well, I go to church on a Sunday. That's wonderful. Praise God. Don't misunderstand me. We'll talk about it in a second. What are you doing for the kingdom? Monday to Saturday. Do people at work know you? Believe in Not just believe in Jesus, that you know him? That he lives inside of you? That the same power that raised Christ from the dead is inside of you? They know who you are? Do your family know what you really believe? Do your neighbors know? Do, do, do you actually overflow with the Spirit of God? Or do you contain it until Sunday and then you can release it in worship? I'm not trying to go at anyone. This is just a reality for each one of us, though. In order, I want to just say this, in order to have no other option. Like Peter and John had. They had no other option but to speak of what they're seeing and hearing. They had to be hearing and seeing things. I'm not trying to be silly about this. I just want to make it very simple. If you're not seeing God move, and if you're not hearing from God, then you don't really have much to say. And actually, there is an option for you that you don't have to speak about it because you've got nothing really to speak about. You, you, but they were in a situation where it's like, my whole life is the kingdom of God. I am just doing this stuff. I just got filled with the Holy Spirit. I had fire on my head. I don't know what was going on. They didn't have a theology for this yet. This just happened yesterday. And they're just like, and we've come out, we preach the gospel, and 5,000 people give their lives to the Lord earlier, and they all get baptized, and then children as well. So you're probably talking about 10,000, 15,000. Oh, and we just healed someone, and another 5,000 just gave their lives to the Lord as well. So I guess we're talking about it. 
Because this is what's happening. This is my life. But if your life is, oh, I, yeah, I think my Bible's somewhere in, in, in one of my rooms. And yeah, I was at church like three weeks ago. And I think the last time I prayed for someone was when like, we all got together and we prayed a quick prayer. And I'm, again, please understand, it's not you. It's them. It's not you. I mean, but I'm like, this isn't to, to, to have a go at anyone. But it's also, it's a challenge for me. What, I, I was at a wedding yesterday, and I was sat next to someone who doesn't know the Lord, and he's asking what I do, and I say, Pastor, and you can just see their face change. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> and he literally went, so what did you do before that? He was just trying to find something else. And, but, you know, we're just talking. And, and of course, I, I tell him about Jesus, and I tell him about my life, and all this kind of stuff. And it kind of helps that I don't sound local, so they're like, why are you here? It's a great opener. Because I'm like, oh, God. And they kind of look at you like, oh, okay. <laughs> but it was a great conversation. But because I knew I had this message coming up, there was just something that happened in me where in my own self, I was kind of thinking through. I met some, some friends at this wedding who I haven't seen in a while. They're Christian. They're, they live in, um, up north. And, of course, you just, hey, what, what are you seeing? What God's doing? How's the church? All that kind of stuff. And something was stirring in me. It was like, I want to make sure I always have fresh testimony. Not for the sake of, oh, look at other, but just because I need to be, and I want to make sure I am experiencing new things with God. There's something new. So please understand, this isn't a, a downward message. This is an invitation for each one of us. We can only be in a position where we cannot but speak of what we're seeing and hearing if we're seeing and hearing stuff. If we're diving into his word and he's revealing his goodness to us. If we're in prayer and his presence and he's giving us words. If I'm actually, actually praying for people and sharing the gospel with them. And when I see someone who's in pain, I, I have no problem. And I, actually, I don't have an option. I have to intervene. I have to at least offer prayer. I want to credit some of our team. They have no idea I'm going to do this. And, but every Thursday, we have our hub here. And I was sat at the table, and I was talking, and suddenly, I wasn't even paying attention, really. I just look up, and I've got three of our amazing team who are praying for this lady. And I'll be honest, as a pastor, I was so proud because no one asked me to pray. Now, hear me. I was actually so <laughs> proud of that because they knew that they could just do it. They didn't have to go, oh, well, the pastor's in the room. We have to get the pastor to pray for this lady for her back. No, no, no. Oh, you need prayer? Let me just pray for you. And I don't know what it was. I just I mean, assumed it was back because I saw them praying for her back. And all I saw was this lady's face just go, just absolute shock. As she was like, all the pain's gone. This is a Thursday at 12 o'clock at our hub. And three of our team, three or four, I can't remember how many of you, the team were just like, oh, you, you're in pain? Let's pray. Let's do this. I don't need to call on someone else. I don't need to get the pastor's attention to, to join in and intervene. I just got to watch her face get healed. That's, that's all I got to do. I just want to commend you for that. And you know who you are. And I just want to commend you. But I want to encourage each one of us. That needs to be our approach. That needs to be our response. You're in pain. I know the one who wants to set you free. Let me tell you about him. So, how did Peter and John get to this place? I want you, can you turn, please? Actually, no, before we go there. I'm getting too excited. I want you to go back to verse 13. Verse 13 says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men who had no special training. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. I'll give you the New King James as well. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men. And they marveled. I love that. They were uneducated, untrained men. And they marveled. And they realized that they must have been with Jesus. The New King James Version. 
they must have been with Jesus. Jesus is what qualifies you. Jesus is who trains you up. I've done a Bible school. I have nothing against Bible school. We run a Bible school. We encourage people, get trained up. But that is not the determining factor if you can operate for God or not. What is it? It's being filled with his presence because I spend time with Jesus. The, these men who were, to, who were judging them were the smartest, most educated men in the entire nation. And they were marveling at young men. Because you have to remember, Peter and John, somewhere between 15 and 21. Because we know that the oldest disciple was 21, and we, it's known, um, believed that the youngest was about 15. So they are young men. It's not random to call them young men. They are young men. And baffling the most educated, trained um, scholars, thank you, in the nation. And they had to recognize one simple fact. They've been with Jesus. There's no other way that they can talk like this. There's no other way that they can operate like this. There's no other way that... About 20,000 people have listened and believed what they had to say over 24 hours and been baptized and added. Not just gave my life to Jesus and walked away. The word is important. It says added. That means they became part of the fellowship. They plugged in. They didn't just go, oh, that's a great story. No, they were plugged in. Why? Because Peter and John were overflowing with the presence of God. They were overflowing with his goodness. They were overflowing with what Jesus had to say. They weren't just making it up. They were telling people about who Jesus was. And stuff started to happen left, right, and center. And we have to realize that there is no major secret to this. There is no major secret to unleashing the kingdom. I need you to really get this. Like This is as simple as message that I can try and give you today. If you want to advance the kingdom of God, you have to spend time with the king. You need to be in the presence of the king. You have to know what the king says. You have to know what he, how he thinks. You have to see what he did when he lived on earth. And you're like, well, how do I know this? Right here. It's all here. If you're not sure how to pray for the sick, I have no problem about training people and doing courses. That's wonderful. But honestly, I'm just going to be repeating what's in here. I'm not reinventing the wheel. Pray for the sick. How did Jesus pray for the sick? He took authority. And he laid hands and he prayed for the sick. And they were healed. Wait, you mean we can do that? Yes. If you're filled with the presence of God, if you've said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, then yes, you can. This is not a complicated message. Are you, are you with me? This is not a complicated time. Well, I just, you know, my workplace, they don't allow God, you know, they don't allow me to talk about him. Do you realize you don't have an option? He lives inside of you. Wherever you go, he's going. Right? It's, it's really quite straightforward. So sometimes I, I remember it was a couple of years ago where there was a massive debate with schools in the UK about separating God from school. And now there's Christian schools, but the other schools aren't Christian and you can't talk about and, and Christians were getting so worked up. And yes, it was sad and it's something to pray into. But, but what really troubled me was the amount of Christians who were like, the kingdom's no longer in school. And I'm like, well... I don't know. It's not exactly like Jesus went, oh, you did a vote, did you? Oh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll ignore my people then. I guess I don't love them anymore. Oh, your workplace doesn't allow religious talk? Oh, I guess they're off limits. No. He lives inside of you, and if he places you in that place, guess what? You're meant to bring his kingdom in that place, in that situation, in the way you talk, in the way you act, in the way you think. Everything you bring the kingdom where you go. But the problem is, most of the time we ignore the king. We ignore the king. And we, we, we squash down the kingdom in our own lives. And, and we almost have this approach where this is for someone else to do. It's for the greats. You know, the great men and women of God. And for me... You know, I'm just lucky that I got to pray for one person a year. And 
And something has to happen in, in you, in me. I cannot give you this hunger. And you need to hear this. I, I can't give this to you. I, I, I can, I'm, I'm showing you what God, what is recorded in his word, that Peter and John were seized by their passion for the king. And it led them to a place where they could do nothing else but speak. In the face of threat, I have no other choice. I have to talk about what I'm seeing and what God is doing. I have to be in this place. I, I have to be bringing his kingdom. I have to unleash it because it's changed my life. It saved me. He saved me. He transformed me. He's still transforming me. And I think sometimes if we just step back into that place of awe and wonder of him, and we just allow him to overwhelm you. Allow his goodness to overwhelm you afresh. Allow his love to overwhelm you afresh. Allow this reality that you are called to so much more. That where you live, that burnt wood is called to so much more than a reputation from the old. That this country, my goodness, the rich heritage of the move of God in this nation. And it's starting to rise again, but I do not want to be on the side watching it happen. I don't have the, uh, maybe I'll post it in the week actually. But I don't know if some of you have seen revivals breaking out across the world. In France, they the Catholic Church had a revival and baptized 25,000 students. Two weeks ago. 25,000 students. In Tampa, in Florida, for three days, they baptized over 10,000 people over Easter. This is happening all over the world. And there was an article that Carla was reading when we were talking about this, where it was talking about the amount of people getting saved and baptized, but there's no churches to add them into. And churches keep on closing. But people are out going, getting saved, but they've got nowhere to go. They've got no church to be added into. We've got no spiritual mothers and fathers to th think through this. Just right, please picture this with me. 10,000 people get added to the kingdom. How many groups do you need to, to manage that? How many, pa like how many mothers and fathers spiritually? Now, this doesn't mean you work full time for the church. No, no, no. I'm just talking about spiritual moms and dads who can raise up these mo young men and women. The church has a duty to be hungry. You have a duty to be hungry. You have a duty to be seeking his kingdom. You have a duty to be recognized as someone who's been with Jesus. You don't need the same education as other people. Now, I encourage you, educate yourself. Plug in. LSM is still open. Please, honestly, we, we want to equip you. If you're not sure, talk to the guys who are in currently who are doing LSM. We're there to equip you and encourage you and show you the revelation of the word. But ultimately, if you can't do that, it doesn't disqualify you. Do you understand that? You have his word available. You have his presence available. I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, are you with me? I'm not even on page two. We'll get there. Can you be recognized as man or woman who has been with Jesus? It's a challenge. I mean that sincerely. Like, no one can answer that for you. That's you. Am I someone who spends time with Jesus? Can I be recognized as that person? Do I have something to say? Am I in a position like Peter who said, I just, I cannot but speak? Because it's just overflowing in my life. Testimony after testimony, revelation after revelation, story after story of God's goodness, God's faithfulness, God's power moving. It's time to sign up again. 
We have to get rid of the fear of men in our lives. My goodness. Um, can you just turn to um, Acts 2, please? Yeah, we're okay. We've got a few more minutes. Give me a few more minutes. Yes? Okay. We don't have a choice. So, <clears throat> I'm just making sure you're paying attention. <laughs> so, Acts 2, um, f- verse 42. I just want to put really easy context here. This is after the upper room. Spirit breaks out. Um, Peter, once again, here he is. He's given, he addresses the crowd, and thousands are saved and baptized. And this is what they did. Right? This is how they disco- This is the secret they discovered to sustain a move of God that started the early church. It's very simple. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They saw property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Let me just break this down very quickly to you. For time's sake, I'm going to go a bit faster. But number one, what did they do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Do we? I said this. I was. Talk, I didn't actually think through my message. I was talking about this at the beginning. What are you feeding yourself on? What are you feeding yourself on day in, day out? And I'm not just saying my teachings or Carl is. I'm talking about are you feeding yourself on the word? Are you feeding yourselves on those who have been gifted by God, the gift of teaching and revelation? Are you, devo- are you devoting yourself to reading the Bible? You know that word devoted means solely minded. Are you soul, solely minded? Are you diving into his word? We had John Collier, the pastor of Gateway in, in Birmingham yesterday at LSM for our, um, once a month on a Saturday. We have our focus day and he was the guest speaker. And he was talking about the kingdom and he was talking about the word of God being seed and I can't go into the whole message, but I encourage you. It was amazing, and it was just so, ref- just a refresher. But he, he used this language that I really liked. He was like, what's your seed packet? And what he was saying were, what, were the ver- what are the verses that you meditate on day and night? What are the seeds that you're planting into your heart? Because if you're not feeding yourself on the word, you're going to be feeding yourself on something. You're not blank. At any moment, something is trying to get your attention. There is some form of seed trying to plant itself in your heart. And if it's not the word, and if it's not preachers, if it's not... Honestly, do you watch healing testimonies? Do you, like, okay, this isn't a criticism, but it's a genuine question. How many of you know what happened, that the examples I gave of Tampa and France? Okay, a couple of you. Okay. Again, this isn't a go at anyone. But I'm like, it's all available. But I am very intentional about what I try and find. And I've learned to ha- I have to be. Because I want to feed myself on something that's going to get me excited, not going to get me discouraged. Because if I want to spend time looking at how bad the church is doing, yeah, I can watch all the videos of all the people who have fallen recently. Falls from grace here, church closing over there. Spiritual, this over there, war over here. Gosh, I can feed myself on that all day long, easily. I'm not saying be unaware, but I'm saying I'm not going to make. Sh- I'm going to make sure that's not the seed that's planting. Yeah. And they were intentional. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. Why? Because the the gospels weren't written yet. You understand? Like we have to put some con. They couldn't go. Okay, well, let's turn to Matthew today. Like that. That wasn't an option. Matthew was in the room. You got to talk to Matthew. You got to talk to. To the teaching. So they devoted themselves to the people who had been with Jesus. In our days, we devote ourselves to the people who have been with Jesus and read what they experienced, read the words of Jesus. So that's number one that they did. Let me just say this for you the world is desperately looking for answers, and if the church doesn't stand up and start bringing them, someone else will. 
That's the reality we're at right now with identity. That's the reality we are at with gender. The church stopped having a voice. And we, got, we lost our voice. We have to regain it. We have to regain our seat at the table. Not by force. Please hear me. Not by force. By demonstration of a better way. But if the church isn't full of hope, love, and power, we have nothing to talk about. And suddenly, they're not going to listen to this. And they go and find it somewhere else. Anyway, number two. I don't know if speed up. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Okay, this is important. Count yourself in. I said this earlier. I, I think I made this, I can't remember where I said it. If you've heard it before, you've heard it. I saw this sign, and I'm really tempted to put it at the front of church, but Carla told me it's no. Um, it says it's really hard to get spiritually fit if you only work out one day a week. And I love it. It's so true. But it's really hard to get spiritually fit if you only come on a sun, if you only work out on a Sunday. You have to be in. You have to count yourself in. Do you realize that the church, that we need what you have? We really need what you have. We really need what each one of you carries. And not everyone's going to have the stage. Not everyone's meant to have a pulpit. Not everyone's meant to be the leader, but everyone's meant to lead their lives. Every one of you is meant to bring the giftings and callings that God has placed inside of you. Every single one of you has one. We need that. The church with a big C needs that. Count yourself in. But also, it's crucial that you choose your, who you fellowship with well. It's so important. Please understand me. I am not saying cut out the world. I'm not saying have zero Christian friends. Actually, we really should have, sorry, no non-Christian friends. We really should have people in our lives who don't yet know the Lord, but we should be influencing them, not the other way around. But so many Christians, I talk with them, and they struggle, and they're being pulled left, right, and center, and then they're not showing up, and they're not fellowshipping with people, and this and that, and you're like, okay, I don't need to know any more than who have you spent time with. It's really easy, because I know I've got key people. If I spend time with them, I'm more in fire for God. I'm more in love with my wife. I'm more passionate about my church. I'm more passionate about my future. And I've got key people in my life that I'm like, if I spend time with them, I get something that fuels me. Now, I need people that I can give to as well. But you've got to know how to position yourself. Chris Valentin put it this way. Um, He said, plant me anywhere in the world. In two weeks, I'll have someone I'm serving, people I'm doing life with, and someone I'm pouring into. And I was like, yes, you need to find that. Who are you receiving from? Who are you serving? Who are you doing life with? Those peers are really important. And who are you pouring into? Anyway, they devoted themselves to fellowship. Number three, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Abby did a phenomenal job this morning. Thank you for just sharing the beauty of the breaking of bread. Do you realize I actually put it in there twice? It says it on the first line, to the breaking of bread, and later down, um, it says that they broke bread in their homes altogether. They put it in twice. Just the importance and the value of remembering and recognizing what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. And it's not just a sad moment. It's a moment of victory. I like to use the phrase that Bill Johnson coined, it's the meal of absolute victory. That's what communion is. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread together. And it's not just about taking the bread, it's what? It's daily remembering what Jesus won for us. What Jesus gave you access to. If you need healing, you need breakthrough, you need change broken off, you need to operate in power, whatever it is, it all originates in the cross. Amen? Amen? All of it. Final ones. They dedicated themselves to prayer. This isn't difficult, right? I'm, please, you understand, none of my message is difficult today. I really hope you get this. I'm just trying to remind you. This is how the church, the early church grew. They prayed together. They dedicated themselves to prayer. And re- revival does not occur outside of the atmosphere of prayer. Never has, never will. It happens in prayer. And I can't go over my whole message on prayer, but I've talked about this before. This isn't about giving God a list and hoping he checks them off. What is prayer? It's putting yourself on the potter's wheel. God, mold me into the answer. 
Thy kingdom come, your will be done. What does that mean? Show me your kingdom, show me your will so that I can do it here on earth with you. That's what prayer is. It's not going, hey, let's pray together on Monday. It doesn't happen here. Please understand. But let's gather, let's pray. God, just would you really heal the sick? I refuse to pray for them, but would you just heal this? No, that, that's a pointless prayer. Now, God, fuel me with a passion to pray for everyone who needs healing. Suddenly, prayer starts to come alive. Prayer starts to change. They devoted themselves to prayer. Number five, all who believed were together and had all things in common. I just want to put it this way. It's a corporate thing. John Colley put, um, said this phrase that was, um, actually it's from Steve Upple, who's pastor of um, All Nations. He said, when the tide rises, all the ship rides. I love that. I think sometimes we forget that actually your breakthrough is a common breakthrough. And if you're hungry, you become contagious around you. They had all things together in common. What did they recognize? This is a corporate thing. I don't want to just have my own breakthrough for the sake of me having a breakthrough. I want to be contagious to those around me. And guys, if you're not in that place where you're feeling like you're dry, get around people who are on fire. Get around people who inspire you. Get around people who are going after what you want to go after. Get around people who are going to fuel the fire inside of you. Final ones, and we'll end here. Day by day, they attended the temple together. Corporate worshiping together. This isn't an individual... Don't isolate yourself. Just don't isolate yourself. And this is us personally, but this is as church, and this is why we do what we do as Life Spring Churches. We are one together. We're not isolated. You recognize that we are not just the people in this room. We belong to a much larger family. And we pull on one another, and we get to lend resources out to other people, and we worship together together. Open heaven, I really can't plug this enough. If you can get there, get there. The reason we hold it in Wolverhampton is simply because it's the largest building. It's not about what location, it's about coming together. Do you understand? And worshiping as one. Finally, they found favor with all people. See, I love this. Because I think we have this concept that if the church is going to thrive, we're going to get more and more People aren't going to want to know about it. They don't want to hear about our lives. They don't want to hear about our stories. But actually, they found favor with all people. Now, I'm not saying there won't be persecution. Please don't misunderstand me. That's a whole other message. And yes, that is a reality. The more you step out for God, the more persecution you will receive. I'm sorry. If you want a peaceful life, do nothing. If you're a Christian, that's really, that's actually the best thing. You want an easy enemy doesn't come after you life. Don't do anything for Jesus. Um, that's a bit harsh, but anyway. But they found favor with people. Are you experiencing favor in your life? Are you the favored one in your workplace? Are you the favored one in your family or friend circle? Uh, friend circle? Not so that you can boast. What do we say in the tithes and offering? That I would have more than enough to be able to give out. But we're meant to find favor. God wants us to find favor. When you're thriving with God, you find favor with man. Look, they didn't complicate it. Let me just end here. Gosh, I've got so much more I could say. They didn't complicate it. They just re-upped their, let's call it a bias. They just they, they made it simple and obtainable for everyone. Do you understand that unleashing the kingdom is not on a table for you in your life? It's really simple. Spend time with Jesus. Devote yourselves to the word of God. Be in prayer. Surround yourself with brothers and sisters. Corporately come together and worship. Plug in. Count yourself in. Serve the local church. Serve the ministries around you. And let's actually advance the kingdom of God here on earth in every area of our lives.
Can you stand with me? We're well over time. I want to do two prayers in particular. Thank you. I'll address that in a second. Thank you. Um, if I could just have some soaking music in the background, that's great. We'll just give a moment. But th- this, th- this is my prayer for each one of us. Um, that you would choose, because it's an invitation, that you would choose to pursue the king once again, like never before. That's a personal thing no one can do for you. Your decision to pursue Jesus, your decision to be in a posi- to, to put yourself in a position where you cannot but speak of what the Lord is doing in your life. You cannot but speak of the testimonies of his power moving. That you're in a position where you are so hungry for him. That unleashing his kingdom everywhere you go becomes your norm. Holy Spirit, I pray for each one of us that you would, we would fan into flame once again passion for you, Jesus. That we would go back to the simplicity of the early days. This isn't a reinventing the wheel message. I just want to encourage you to go back to the simplicity of spending time with Jesus. Spending time in his word, getting so fueled up by him. Filled of the Holy Spirit, Peter replied. And they marveled because they recognized these are people, men and women who have been with Jesus. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in this church. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And the other prayer I want to pray for each one of us um, that I felt was about the fear of man. The fear of man overtakes us so easily. Fear of rejection, fear of not being understood, fear of being criticized, whatever it is. I want to just pray for you right now in the name of Jesus that you would face that fear. Here's the thing. I feel like so many of us wait for God to take away the fear of man before we do anything about it. But the truth is God doesn't remove every obstacle. He tells us to conquer them. And some, t- some of you, there's an obstacle in front of you. And it may, I believe for a lot of us, it's the fear of man. It's the fear of what if I pray for that person and they don't get healed? What if I share and they don't understand? What if I just look like a fool? Whatever it is. And you've got this obstacle in front of you. And I was praying about this this morning. And I feel like you're looking and praying that the obstacle be removed. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to answer that. I'm asking you to conquer it. And I, you're not doing it alone. You're doing it with him. But there's an obstacle in front of you that he has given you authority to conquer. And I want to encourage you right now, if that's you and you just feel that, just place a hand on your heart because you know there's an obstacle. It could be fear of man, could be the financial situation, time situation, whatever it is. And I just feel you've been praying specifically for God to remove that obstacle. And I'm encouraging you that he has given you all the tools to conquer that obstacle in your life. That he is doing it with you. But I want to encourage you, get into his word because his promises over that situation are in his word. And Father, I pray for each one of us that we would be hmm, sensitive to what you have to say. Even in this week as, it, uh, as the week comes now. That we would find ourselves in divine appointment situations. And that we would take the risk. Each one of you, I encourage you, seek the risk. Be willing to step out. Be willing to share with your neighbor. Be willing to share with your loved ones. Be willing to pray for that person in the street or at the store. Be willing to step out and unleash his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, bless you all. I have, just as we're closing now, sorry, I do have just a a quick notice. Um, so we didn't communicate properly. Uh, the outreach is actually going to be taking place this Saturday in Cannock. We're going to go to Cannock Town Center for the outreach. So we're going to meet 
um, at the town centre, you can park in the area, and then there is a Costa right in the town centre in Canic. If you're not sure, we'll put the address online. We're going to meet there and then go into Canic Town Centre for our outreach this Saturday. Okay, and that's still at 10 a.m., but it's in Canic. Okay, wonderful, guys. Be blessed. We love you. There's nothing you can do about that, and we will see you later on this week. <laughs>